Good evening, everybody. I'll uh, call the meeting to order. Uh, tonight we have two public meetings, followed by, I believe, unless there's something on the addendum, with no business, which means, which is very strange. We're usually a pretty busy committee. But um, I will just read the public meeting introduction, uh, which uh, talks about the process. Uh, notice of collection. Personal information collected as a result of this public hearing and on the forms provided at the back of the room is collected under the authority of the Planning Act and will be used to assist in making a decision on, the, on this matter. All names, addresses, opinions, and comments may be collected and may form part of the minutes, which will be available to the public. Questions regarding the collection should be forwarded to the Director of Planning and Development. Uh, the purpose of public meetings is to present planning applications in a public forum as required by the Planning Act. Following presentations by the applicant, committee members will be afforded an opportunity to ask questions uh, for clarification or further information. The meeting will then be open to the public for comments and questions. Interested persons are requested to give their name and address for recording in the minutes. There's also a sign-in sheet for interested members of the public at the back of the room. No decisions are made at public meetings concerning applications unless otherwise noted. The public meeting is held to gather public opinion. An exception to this rule is combined reports, which consolidates the public meeting and comprehensive reports. These applications are deemed by staff as straightforward and routine. This business practice has been in place for a number of years and is received by the app applicants as efficient customer service and effective use of committee time. Please note that staff use discretion in determining if an application can be a combined public meeting comprehensive report to expedite the approval process. Public meetings report, reports are provided to inform the public and all relevant information. Uh, information gathered is then referred back to planning and development staff for the preparation of a comprehensive report and recommendation to the planning committee. This means that after the meeting tonight, staff will be considering the comments made by the public in their further review of applications. When this review is completed, a report will be prepared making a recommendation for action to this committee. The recommendation is typically to approve with conditions or to deny. Uh, this committee then makes a recommendation on the applications to City Council. City Council has the final say on the application from the city's perspective. Following Council decision, notice will be circulated in accordance with the Planning Act. If a person or public body would otherwise have an ability to appeal the decision of the Council of the Corporation of the City of Kingston to the local planning uh, appeal tribunal, but the person or public body does not make oral submissions at a public meeting or make written submissions to the city of Kingston before the bylaw is passed, the person or public body is not entitled to appeal the decision. Thank you. Um, our first uh, request is a zoning bylaw amendment for 9 Portsmouth Avenue and 15 Portsmouth Avenue. And I believe it's the IBI group that are up to bat. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So my name is Mark Ty. I'm a registered professional planner with the IBI group. Uh, here tonight for the statutory public meeting for zoning bylaw amendment of three properties at the corner of Portsmouth and King Street West in Kingston. The request is to allow for the construction of a 12 unit, three and a half stories stacked townhouse development uh, at the corner, um, made way for by the demolition of three existing dwellings on the property. 
As noted, the application is for uh, three properties uh, along the eastern frontage of Portsmouth Avenue, wrapping around onto King Street, across from St. Lawrence College, uh, the provincial campus to the south, uh, New Providence Care Hospital to the southwest, and just of note, um, in particular, is the uh, Providence Care Secondary Plan and the Provincial Campus Secondary Plan, um, which would allow for significant development kitty corner to the subject property. Uh, so that's some of the broader context in the, in the area. The existing um, properties, three separate parcels currently, uh, each contain a single detached dwelling. Um, they have been there, uh, they're the original dwellings on the lot as far as we're aware. Um, all containing a single unit, uh, all currently rental tenure. The um, surrounding uses, as I pointed out, is a mix of institutional and predominantly residential, um, associated with the Portsmouth neighborhood to the west or the east of St. Lawrence College. There's also significant open space in the area, notably uh, Lake Ontario Park. The property is in close proximity to a number of uses. Uh, Kingston Transit Transfer Point at St. Lawrence College, uh, as I said, Providence Care, uh, Provincial Campus, uh, Portsmouth Village itself uh, to the east along King Street West, um, and then the future high density residential mixed use uh, across the street as part of the Providence um, uh, secondary plan. The proposal uh, is, is it for three and a half story, 12 unit stacked townhouses. At this point, conceptually, we would have 34 bedrooms, a mix of two and three bedrooms, um, 11 parking spaces, so almost one to one, uh, bicycle parking uh, on the north side next to the parking, and then a landscaped amenity area uh, in the rear yard. This is a conceptual site plan. It shows the building uh, close along the, the streetscape to kind of define the edge. Um, individual accesses to each uh, unit would be from directly from the sidewalk, um, 11 parking spaces, bicycle parking, uh, as well as garbage and recycling storage uh, in the side yard along Portsmouth Avenue. There's uh, provision for a meter wide landscape buffer along the edge around the parking area and in the rear yard intended to be a uh, landscaped open space with uh, at grade or first level porches and then upper level balconies. The concepts here show uh, the elevations from Portsmouth and then uh, from the rear uh, of the building. Um, so intention is for a mixture of traditional materials, brick, stone, uh, et cetera. Um, the owner or developer is a, uh, looking for a tra fairly traditional style for Kingston in terms of the, the mix of materials and the uh, Victorian design with perhaps some kind of modern touches uh, inserted as well. We've reviewed the application with respect to the official plan and the zoning bylaw. Uh, we're of the opinion that it satisfies all the policies of the official plan with respect to uh, adjacent uses, infill development, uh, medium and high density residential policies. Also with respect to uh, housing districts, infill and off-campus housing, on that point, I'll note that the owner is looking for this to be market housing, not oriented towards students, although it is located in close proximity to college. Um, the intention is more that there's uh, employment uses nearby, particularly Providence Care Hospital, um, Queens West Campus, et cetera. So um, this is reflected in the parking ratio as well. It's close to one to one. Um, so the intention is that it's, it is very viable for the wider rental market. With respect to zoning, it's currently in an A5 zone, as is the majority of the, in the neighborhood east of Portsmouth Avenue. The request is to place it in a site-specific B3 zone, which would allow for a multiple family dwelling, uh, such as being proposed. The request is to allow for um, a reduction in the minimum yards, uh, particularly along the front to bring it closer to the street, also um, on the easterly side yard. Um, building height, there's no minimum or no maximum building height in the zoning uh, currently for that zone. We're looking for three and a half stories or this is a type of 12 meters, uh, not 13. Um, also a lot of occupancy uh, relief as well as parking. Um, amenity area, we're actually able to meet the amenity area requirement of 18.5 square meters per dwelling unit. Um, so no relief is required there. 
So in conclusion, we believe the application is consistent with the PPS, conforms to the official plan, and, and is appropriate. And uh, we are supportive of the, of the request and uh, would recommend it for approval to council. Um, so that's everything. I'll, I'll note that the owner, uh, one of the owners is here tonight, Asante Garrison as well, um, and, and myself as the agent, so we'll be able to answer questions. Thank you. Uh, and I believe Amy is taking care of this file, so I'll turn to her to make comments. Uh, through you, Mr. Confirm, that uh, notice was provided for this public meeting in accordance with the Planning Act with notices placed on the property 20 days in advance and uh, notices sent by mail to 38 uh, properties uh, within 120 meters of the subject property. There was a courtesy notice uh, in the wake last week on June 26th. And to date, I haven't received any public comments uh, in writing or by phone or by counter, although I did receive one uh, note from the local councillor. Thank you. I will, uh, I will turn to the committee then. Are there any questions or comments regarding this application? Yes, Councillor Asanik. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just one question. It looks like from the diagram that the townhouses are right on the sidewalk, so there would be room for a couple of trees along the side or the back. I know that's the site plan question, but I just wondered. Question uh, through you, Mr. Chair. So the application is proposing a reduction in the in the side yard and uh, the front yard setbacks, but. Um, there would be enough room um, along the, the frontage for some plantings. I'll note also that engineering had requested a one meter road widening um, to widen the sidewalk. If you're familiar with the area, you know it's quite tight, particularly at the corner at the intersection. Um, so the sidewalk would be widened, which would provide some more breathing room, um, but there would still be some room for landscaping as well. It, it is intended though to bring the building closer to the street, create a bit of an urban, um, face, I guess, so um, it won't be a, a seven and a half meter yard by any means, but yeah. Thank you. Um, could you take the chair just for a second? Well, more than a second, but a uh, quick question. Uh, in looking at the plan, I guess my only initial concern, and perhaps you can address this, um, is there, are there going to be any issues of overlook from the balconies or behind the building since it's three stories in what's primarily a one and a half story uh, neighborhood? Uh, no, good question and certainly a common one for infill. So the um, property to the east, I'll see if I have a good air photo that shows it. So here, so um, currently there's, so this is the subject property here. Currently, this property on the other side of the neighboring property was recently given a zoning bylaw amendment to allow two, um, maybe about approximately three-story, um, three-unit dwellings. So um, the condition, I guess, in the area is for some of that kind of infill to happen with some reduced lot lines. Um, on this side, because of the, the large driveway on the west side of the subject land here, um, there is some space, um, but the the buffer that we're proposing on the west, on the east side yard, sorry, of the proposed development um, is significant, bigger than we've seen in some of these other similar projects um, and one recently that we had done um, on Earl Street. And so it does provide um, a minimum of four meters, so which is about uh, 15, 15 feet. The rear yards are intended to have um, kind of at grade um, decks at best, you can kind of see it through here, and then there will be balconies at the second floor. So one concept we had had some uh, third floor balconies, but we went away from those because of that issue. So um, we're trying to treat that frontage sensitively in terms of the overlook there. Um, I think it's just it's something that we've seen um, along that frontage um, as it densifies, I guess, um, that we are getting a little bit closer to those yards. Um, but the intention is to provide enough of a setback and not be high to have a, to avoid that overlook. Thank you. And um, I applaud the, the fact that it's almost one-to-one -one, uh, parking. Often that's uh, when we reduce that, we get a neighborhood concern in residential areas. 
So, and I look forward to the comprehensive report with lots of uh, accommodation for bicycle parking as well. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I will now turn to the public. Uh, there's a microphone at this chair here and a microphone at this chair. Anybody who wishes to speak are more than welcome uh, to go to one of those microphones. You're given uh, an opportunity to, uh, to speak to the issue. Make sure you give your name and address. And you have five minutes. I'm getting cued by the clerk here, and you get five minutes, so thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Frank Dixon, 495 Alfred, Department 2, K7K, 4J4. Thanks to the planner for the presentation and the information from staff and the questions so far. I had a question about um, how many bedrooms are there currently in the three houses that are there now? I'm um, just looking at, like, if, that, if this gets approved and those get taken down, we're going to lose those in the short term, right? If we do get around to building this, then we're going to be gaining, you know, in a bit of a longer term. But because my concern is we're looking at a real big shortage of housing next little while. Um, with the increased density that the project proposes, we're going to have uh, some sort of a traffic impact because we are close to two arterial roads, right? You're going to be accessing off Portsmouth, which is a busy street, and then you're close to King Street, which is also very busy. Um, as you said, there's a lot of stuff there. Hospital is there. St. Lawrence College is close to Portsmouth Village. There's large development going in on the south side of King. And next, my other question is, um, Mr. Tiles talked about wanting to widen the sidewalk there, and it seems like a good idea. He says that that is a bit of a narrow spot there with traffic, right? And you've got a lot of buses going through there. Certainly in the winter, it's an issue. Um, I go through, through there now and then. Um, so I'm just wondering, is there really enough space there to widen the sidewalk by a meter? I'd like to see that happen, but how does that impact on um, what's going on with the traffic situation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we put forward all of the questions and comments and give the proponent an opportunity to speak to it at the end. Uh, so, uh, I recognize Councillor Shell. Yes. You know where I live. <laughs> it's on the web. Um, I was very pleased when I saw this uh, application come forward this is the sort of thing I've been asking for <laughs> for a while. Uh, two arterial roads, um, housing that uh, really doesn't function for as a family home area anymore. And uh, I am extremely happy to see this uh, plan come forward. Um, I had mentioned um, to the uh, owners that uh, to me this is a signature corner. It's the beginning of uh, Portsmouth Village. So it's, it's really quite a, an important uh, corner, and I think it's probably the first design for this company in Kingston, so it's an important uh, statement for them. So uh, I'm pleased that they have uh, come forward with a design that sort of fits the uh, idea of Portsmouth Village. I, I'm hoping they refine it a bit more to make it a little more punchy. Um, because it is such a signature spot, but I'm certainly very much in favor of this type of infill uh, that can function so well for the major institutions that are growing uh, in the area. So that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any further questions from the public or comments? Seeing none, uh, going, going, gone. Uh, are there any further comments that uh, that the committee would like to to make? I'm sorry, I should have allow allowed you to address that first. It's been a long day already. Go ahead. No, no problem. I thought I was off the hook. Um, so, Mr. Dixon's questions. So, I'm not sure how many bedrooms are currently existing. Um, if I had to guess, I'd probably say three to four per per dwelling. Um, so, they will be lost while the while the property is redeveloped. But you know that that's the uh, kind of has to happen for, for new 
development and new bedrooms to be added to the property. Um, concern about traffic at the busy intersection, that's certainly something that was um, discussed with the city and it, currently the there are three driveways entering into the site or into the existing three properties right now. Um, I know just anecdotally, the owner has said that the person who is at one of these two, you know, they kind of have to position themselves and time themselves because cars coming around the corner, they don't have enough time to, you know, if they're pulling out, somebody could whip around the corner quite quickly and they wouldn't have time. So they're, you know, very tentative about getting out of there or they just go really quick and get out of the way. So I think engineering staff are pleased that the entrance would get moved as far away from the intersection as possible to provide that kind of distance and separation. Um, and then in terms of space for widening of the sidewalk, um, I think that's precisely because it is such a tight intersection that they do want to widen um, the sidewalk and allow for a more pedestrian comfort, um, especially when buses, as you said, are coming around the corner. Um, it gives that extra little bit of breathing room. So we will be losing that space from the properties. It will be taken out of the properties um, to provide that widening. Um, so it, w it won't take away from the street. So. Thank you. Now I'll turn to the committee. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, um, we'll move on. I just want to say it looks like a good infill project. Now, I'll move on to our second and last public meeting. And it's uh, held pursuant to the Planning Act, uh, Official Plan and Zoning Bylaw Amendment. And this concerns secondary suites. And I believe it's Andrea who's addressing this. Thank you. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, notice of these applications was given in accordance with the Planning Act um, by providing a statutory public meeting notice in the Whig Standard on June 12, 2018, more than 20 days prior to this public meeting tonight. Notice was also mailed to all required public agencies and to 21 property owners who had requested to receive notification of these applications. A courtesy notice was also placed in the WIG standard on June 24th. Um, we have not received any official public correspondence to date, um, but staff have filled several uh, phone calls and emails inquiring about the amendments and clarification questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any uh, questions or comments from the committee? Seeing none, we'll open this for uh, public input. Thank you very much. That's okay. It's good to see somebody else has faux pas as well. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so good evening, Mr. Chair, Planning Committee, and members of the public. Um, I'm here this evening to present the city's initiated official plan and zoning bylaw amendment applications to broaden second unit residential permissions across the municipality. Um, we'll, I'm going to begin by just providing a little background information and context um, to understand what's um, led the city to initiate these amendments. Um, I'll outline the applications and then provide um, some next steps um, in terms of the applications. Um, so in 2011, the Planning Act was amendment to, amended to require municipalities um, to establish official plan policies and zoning bylaw provisions um, to permit second residential units in detached dwellings, semi-detached dwellings, um, and row house dwellings, as well as in ancillary structures, um, which many refer to as coach houses. Um, the Planning Act changes also remove the ability to appeal second unit policies and zone provisions, um, except for by the minister. Um, and it, unless it was uh, done through an official plan comprehensive review. And then further in 2016, the Planning Act was amended again to even remove appeals by the public during an official plan comprehensive review. So the only one that is able to appeal second unit provisions are, is the, the minister. 
Um, all, all of this was really um, stemming from a large mandate from the province um, to provide municipalities across Ontario with more support and control over establishing affordable housing initiatives um, in, in establishing second units. Um, the provincial policy statement um, has further complemented uh, these, these changes to the Planning Act by indicating that intensification should be um, promoted and facilitated and second units are um, one item that's specifically referenced as, as being included in that. In 2013, the city initiated official plan and zoning bylaw amendments to address second residential units. Um, the official plan amendments at this time um, permitted second residential units in single semis and, and row house dwellings, um, however, did not permit them in accessory structures. Um, the complementary zoning bylaw amendments um, were enacted through a pilot project area, um, so they were only permitted within dwellings and in very specific areas of the municipality. Um, a holding symbol was also used in the areas outside of the urban boundary to require a number of conditions to be met prior to um, lifting this holding symbol and proceeding to a, a, obtaining a building permit. In 2017, uh, the official plan um, was reviewed and, and adopted, um, and at this time, um, new official plan policies pertaining to second residential units were put in place that are far less restrictive um, and now do permit um, second units within accessory structures. And the other major change to it was it also very, very much now spe um, specifically identifies that um, Second units um, are to be permitted in all of those zones in the municipality that permit single semis and row house dwellings. Um, so overall, our current um, five main principal zoning bylaws um, do not conform to the official plan policies, planning act legislation, um, and components of the provincial policy statement. The purpose and effect of these applications is to broaden um, second unit permissions to be in accordance with provincial legislation and policies, while also establishing um, appropriate um, provisions to regulate their development and to address servicing constraints. Um, this map here just highlights um, the current areas in um, three of the zoning bylaws where we, we do currently permit second units within dwellings only. Um, so as you can see, there's a large part of the um, east end where it's permitted. Um, this is the area in green and portions of the west end. Um, everything in white there, so primarily um, the downtown area and um, portions in the west end are, are not permitted at all to have second units. Um, and everything in the yellow outside the urban boundary is subject to a, a holding symbol that was primarily put in place um, because these areas are subject to private services and to ensure that there's adequate um, water quantity, quality, and um, sewage capacity. Um, current zoning regulations, they also have um, size restrictions that they're only able to be 40% of the gross floor area of the main dwelling unit. Um, there you can have one parking, you must have one parking space. Um, this can be provided through a tandem arrangement, um, so essentially one car in front of the other. Um, there's driveway restrictions, um, and it also only allows one residential, um, second residential unit per lot, um, and they're also not permitted on lots that would already contain a boarding house, lodging house, or a garden suite. Um, they're prohibited in a floodplain. Um, servicing connections are required, um, and then as previously indicated, the holding symbol um, is utilized outside the urban boundary. So the, the applications tonight, the proposed official plan amendment, um, the current official plan policies that were established as part of the official plan update were intended to permit second units um, across the entire municipality. However, um, in the actual um, rural, hamlet, and agricultural area designation policies, it um, doesn't clarify this very well, um, and you could argue that it may not be permitted. So we are proposing to amend those policies to provide that clarification that um, it is permitted in the rural agricultural cultural and hamlet areas. We're also proposing to incorporate a new policy to indicate that a second residential unit within an accessory structure may not be severed from the lot containing the principal dwelling. Um, so this, um, the, the rationale for this is primarily looking at the, the rural areas um, and wanting to maintain rural character um, and not opening the door up for additional severances in these areas. Um, and it's also applicable citywide as well as the intent is really to provide um, affordable housing opportunities and to provide, and these should be um, accessory to the main dwelling. Um, so it would defeat the purpose of, to allow them um, on their own lots. We're also proposing to amend a current schedule we have in the official plan 
that addresses servicing constraints um, to specifically identify known or potential constraints. Um, so this, this map right here um, displays, um, and it is an existing map that is in our official plan, um, where, where, where there is known or, or potential servicing constraints. Um, except the, the current map we have right now um, doesn't indicate what these specific constraints are. So we worked with Utilities Kingston um, to find out what the specific issues are in these areas, which provides um, um, more information for staff when reviewing applications at the pre-application stage and um, for residents as well. Um, just to identify what a, a couple of them are, um, some of them are combined sewer and, and storm water where there's sewer surcharging issues. Um, sewer surcharging is in, common in other areas as well. Um, and then there's also sewage capacity constraints. Um, we're also proposing to include a new policy um, re with respect to a holding symbol. Um, and I'll speak a little bit about this more when I may get into the proposed zoning bylaw amendment, but we are proposing to use a holding symbol in certain um, situations and the official plan policy is just intended to um, um, complement this. Um, and then one policy um, not really related to second residential units that we're proposing as part of this is to include a new policy in our servicing and infrastructure um, section to indicate that Planning Act applications for new residential units that are located in a known or potential servicing constraint um, that are identified on the schedule I uh, just displayed must demonstrate adequate water and wastewater capacity and the protection of public health and safety. Um, and the, this, this development of this policy um, basically stems from the fact that servicing constraints are not simply just ap applicable to second units. Um, and as part of Planning Act, the review of Planning Act applications today, um, this already occurs where we work with Utilities Kingston to review um, capacity, um, but now we're just making a specific reference in the mapping to it. Um, so the proposed zoning bylaw amendments, um, we're proposing a consistent standard definition for a second residential unit, um, which means a separate dwelling unit, which is ancillary to a principal residential dwelling unit, includes a separate kitchen, washroom, and living space. Um, we're proposing um, one parking space to be required per dwelling unit. Um, permitted zones, so a second residential unit shall be permitted in association with the following permitted uses, um, single detached dwellings, semi-detached dwellings, linked dwelling units, and row house dwelling units. Um, this is what's currently permitted in the OP, and now all five um, zoning bylaws would allow second units um, to be permitted in all, all those zones that permit those um, housing forms. Um, so in regards to where we are proposing to use the holding symbol, um, we're pro proposing to utilize this um, for two specific servicing constraint areas. Um, the first one applies to hamlets and rural estate subdivisions um, where we're going to be requiring a long-term pump test and letter of opinion from a qualified engineer stating that the private water supply is sufficient to support the second unit. And the rationale for this is particularly a lot of these real estate subdivisions um, were approved on the basis of very detailed hydrogeological studies that showed that the water availability was there to accommodate um, the dwellings um, that were being constructed um, and want to ensure that if a number of these dwellings were to establish second units that it would not impact the water supply on um, the neighbors in, in that particular area. Um, the second area we're proposing to use a uh, holding symbol is in the um, Canna subdivision um, just north of um, Kingston Mills. Um, and this is primarily um, because the, this area is on communal services. Um, and again, um, there could be capacity issues if a number of second units um, came into these areas. Um, so we are looking for a letter of opinion to the Satisfaction Utilities Kingston, um, confirming that the second unit, um, that there won't be capacity issues if, if they are developed. Um, we also have a few other constraint areas, um, and this, this is primarily where we're being a little bit restrictive with um, some of these zone provisions. Um, I know I have the map right here. So um, constraint area three and constraint area four, um, you can't see too well from here, but this is the area in red and in, in yellow. Um, and these areas were permitting, were um, putting in a provision that a second residential unit's not permitted in a cellar or a basement. Um, this is primarily because these areas are subject to sewer surcharging and there's an increased risk of basement flooding. Um, so for the protection of public health and safety, um, we are proposing that restriction there. Um, this would 
not prevent somebody from establishing a second unit um, anywhere else in the house or to establish potentially a, a coach house as well. Um, and this, um, these restrictions can also, we can look to remove them once infrastructure upgrades have been made and the problem um, becomes alleviated. Um, so the lands identified, um, there's one more area um, identified in constraint area five. So this is um, in, um, in Westbrook and in northern part of the east end in the urban boundary where there simply is just not enough sewage capacity. Um, and in these particular areas until infrastructure upgrades are made, um, we are going to be prohibiting second residential units altogether in, in these two areas. Um, we are proposing that second residential units are not permitted on a lot containing a garden suite, boarding house, lodging house, or two principal dwelling units. Um, and this is to avoid per permitting multiple units on one residential lot, primarily in low density areas um, that could result in issues affecting um, parking compatibility and um, amenity space um, servicing constraints. Um, a second residential unit shall only be permitted if it's connected to municipal services or private water and sewage services approved by the authority having jurisdiction. So this is just to confirm that there's adequate servicing and um, it, particularly in like coach house situations, they must be able to hook up to um, services and have services. A second residential unit shall not be permitted in a floodplain, um, complying with the provincial policy statement and official plan that we direct development away from natural hazards for protection of life and property. Um, a maximum of one second residential unit is permitted per lot. So we are only proposing that there can be one per lot. So you couldn't have a coach house and a second unit within the dwelling as well. And again, this is to prevent multiple units on one lot where um, it wasn't intended. Um, in terms of density, um, where any of the bylaws calculate density as a measure of um, dwelling units per net hectare, a second residential unit shall be exempt from this calculation. Um, this is mainly included to encourage intensification um, and we are trying to promote these and um, to reduce restrictions around them. So if they are included in a density calculation, many of them would not be permitted to proceed. Um, and due to the scale of them, we, we felt that they can be exempt from density calculations. In terms of parking, we are permitting, um, proposing to permit tandem parking spaces um, to accommodate a second unit, um, but the parking space location shall meet all other applicable provisions of the bylaw. Um, so this is to allow for additional flexibility to accommodate um, parking for that second unit, um, but, but again, important to note that other provisions have to be met in the bylaw, so parking um, size, length, and width um, would still have to be maintained. Uh, where a second residential unit is attached to the principal dwelling unit, uh, the second residential unit may have a, a separate entrance or share a joint entrance vestibule with the principal dwelling unit. And again, this is to provide, um, so you couldn't have two separate um, entrances off the front, but a tenant could essentially share the, the entrance through the, the front door to provide an additional way um, to accommodate a second unit if a property may not be able to um, have the room to have an exterior entrance at the rear or side of the property. Uh, the exterior entrance where there is one to the second unit shall be accessed by a 1.2 meter wide unobstructed walkway provided from the front of the principal dwelling. Um, and this is primarily for emergency services to ensure that they are able to access the second unit um, and that it will not be uh, um, obstructed by anything. Um, where there is no vehicular access um, provided to the second unit, the maximum length of the walkway um, shall be 40 meters. Um, and this was a provision that was um, specifically requested by emergency services um, in that um, with um, extended long walkways and they don't have a um, driveway to get to it, um, it can cause issues in response time in being able to um, obtain um, who's living in the second unit. Um, it's particularly more applicable in um, coach house situations as well. Uh, no person may park a vehicle on any part of a walkway. Um, so it, again, for emergency service access and ensuring the walkway is not unobstructed. Um, the gross floor area of the second residential unit must be less than the gross floor area of the principal dwelling. Um, so this is um, a much more lenient policy than our, our provision than our, our current restrictions that require 40% um, to be um, put in place of the gross floor area. Um, so a, a lot of the units aren't able to comply with this, that uh, proposals that we see. So um, this, is, this is a way that um, can allow them to proceed more. And we've also um, received very clear direction from the province that um, aside from just requiring them to be um, smaller in size than the primary dwelling. Um, we shouldn't be restricting their size in, um, any more than that. 
Um, so for detached second units, so the, the coach houses, um, we have some um, particular specific policies um, surrounding these ones. Um, a second unit um, will be permitted in a t detached accessory building, um, but they must meet the requirements of the accessory building regulations, except the rear yard setback shall not be less than three meters, and interior side yard setback shall not be less than 1.2 meters. Um, in our discussions with um, the Ministry of Municipal Affairs, um, they would really like to see um, our provisions around coach houses not to be any more restrictive than our current um, accessory structure provisions. Um, and so we are proposing to make reference to those. Um, however, some of our zones and some of the bylaws um, allow accessory structures to go right up to a zero lot line. Um, and a lot of the setbacks for accessory structures were not developed with the intent of habitable space being in these structures. So we are proposing um, that they have to meet those regulations, but in those situations where an accessory structure may be only required to meet zero meter lot line, um, we are proposing that they have to have at least three meters um, from the back and uh, 1.2 meters from the side. Um, okay. uh, detached accessory building containing a second unit must be located in the interior side yard or rear yard. Um, this is primarily just to maintain streetscape and to ensure that the primary um, dwelling um, really is the, the principal unit um, and that, that the coach house is accessory. Uh, the footprint of a building containing uh, a detached uh, unit excluding an accessory use which serves the principal dwelling may not exceed 40% of the footprint of the principal dwelling. Um, or where the principal dwelling is a footprint of 125 square meters or less, um, it must be 50 square meters. Um, so this, this provision is essentially to ensure that um, the second unit really remains in, um, ancillary in appearance to the primary dwelling and where um, the primary dwelling may, may be a smaller home where it's um, less than 125 square meter footprint. Um, for a coach house to be 40% of that, it would be um, a very small living space. So in, in that case, they would be able to potentially go above the 40% a bit um, and be at least 50 square meters to um, ensure that we're um, permitting functional space for these coach houses. Um, so those are the, those are the um, provisions at this point in, in regards to second units. Um, there is one more um, zoning provision that we're proposing um, in zoning bylaw 8499, which is um, the old city of Kingston zoning bylaw. Um, there's currently a provision in there right now that prohibits the use of a cellar as a dwelling unit or as a habitation unit unless otherwise indicated in the bylaw. Um, so this zoning bylaw defines a cellar as being um, less than 50% um, above grade. Um, and this is prohibited all around. So um, we're proposing to remove this provision altogether. Um, to allow it to be consistent with the other bylaws that don't have this um, and to also, which will also allow for second units to um, be able to locate in the, in the cellar, which they currently would not be. Um, I do I just have some images here just to get an idea of where, where these would be permitted um, in the types of different forms. So um, the first house there, you can see in the yellow where there would be a second unit. So in the, in the basement, in the second one, it's in the upper story um, and then attached to the building, um, the, the third house there. Um, in this particular scenario, this is just a top-up view where you can see that there's a coach house in the back of the second building, um, and I have a few diagrams on this just so you can get an idea of the, the scale and, and what it would mean to the surrounding properties. Um, but I should note, though, that in accordance with our provisions, you are only allowed one per lot, so even though it does show one inside the house in the back, that wouldn't be allowed. We've just um, shown it all in one just to um, simplify things. Um, so it, here's a, this is a good example of a, of a coach house in the back. Um, and this is actually done to scale where um, it is three meters from the property line. It is 1.2 meters from the side yard. Um, it's 40% of the footprint of the main dwelling. A legal parking space is in the front and there is a um, 1.2 meter walkway that's leading to it. So in this particular situation, it would comply with, um, with the zoning bylaw. Um, the other thing I should note as well is that other provisions of the bylaw are still applicable um, to these as well. So, for example, um, last year there's a 30%, a minimum 30% landscaped open space requirement um, that was put into the zoning bylaws, and coach houses would still be subject to meeting that as well. Um, so in this particular situation, um, this does comply with the 30% um, landscape requirement. And it's just showing a different view of that. And then the, the top-down um, view as well. 
So the next steps for these applications, we currently have an online survey that's up from June 27th to July 13th. Um, we've had good response so far. I think we've received close to 100 responses. Um, so we would encourage anybody to um, fill that out as well. Um, we're gonna be having further consultation with the Ministry of Municipal Affairs on these provisions. Um, reviewing all technical comments and public correspondence. And based on all of that, um, we're, we're likely going to be refining um, some of these proposed amendments based on the feedback. Um, and then in the fall of this year, um, we anticipate having an additional statutory public meeting with um, a comprehensive report um, because we do anticipate that there may be some changes and um, would likely warrant additional um, statutory public meeting for those. And that's it, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'll turn to the committee if there are any comments or questions from the committee. Okay. Yes. Councillor Turner. Thank you. And through you, Mr. Turner. That was a very comprehensive report. I thank you. And there was one question I had, but you answered it very well with the visual, and I thought that was very effective about the um, th how far away the, the, the suite would be from the fence in the backyard. So that was very, very good. So thank you. It's great. Yes, Councillor Sanek. Thank you, Chair. So where secondary suites used to have to be no more than 40% of the, now that's being changed, is it? So if the secondary suite is inside a house, not a coach house, but inside a house, now it could be up to 49%. Is that where you had the slide the floor area requirements, and you're saying we've taken out 40% as long as it's not more than 50%? Yes, through you, Mr. Chair. Yes, that's it. So as long as it's just um, smaller in um, gross floor area than the, main, than the main dwelling, then that would be okay. Um, the only place where we are proposing a restriction in size is with the coach house, and we are using a 40% actual footprint. Um, but, but if it's within a dwelling, um, we're not using that 40% cap anymore. Okay, thank you. And just to follow to that, so really much difference between like a semi and then having a secondary suite. Is there other than with the semi, the, all the walls are, you know, it's like two complete different families living there. But if we're going to do then up to 49% of the gross floor area, uh, you know, that... That's a change. Yeah. yeah, no, that's, um, it is, you, you could have more floor space dedicated to it. Um, one, of, one of the areas um, that we've noticed where it could be helpful as well is a lot of people would like to use their entire basement um, as um, space for a second unit and sometimes that's capped off um, where they're, they're unable to utilize that entire space because they don't meet that requirements. Um, and now in this, the entire basement could be used as that, but. Thank, thank you. Could you take the chair? Thank you. A uh, couple of things. Um, still can't quite get my head around the idea of tandem and stack parking. I think that's a potential issue uh, uh, with, with neighbors and could be problematic. Um, with the side yard and the rear yard required setbacks, um, if, if somebody wanted to alter that, would they have to come to this committee and request a full uh, zoning amendment? Or could it go through committee of adjustment, which concerns me somewhat? And the other question, I share uh, Councillor Osanek's concern. Uh, what, if, if we can go 49% for a secondary suite, how is that different than a duplex? In my head before, when it was 40%, that made a clear distinction between what a secondary suite was and what a duplex was. And I think that gets muddied by going to 49%. Having said all of that, I wanna thank you. I think the best way to address uh, to address uh, affordable housing is probably through secondary suites and representing the core, a core award in the core area of the city. For too long we've had, because of the housing shortage, illegal secondary suites. And by legalizing them, and then 
they, we can ensure that they're built to code uh, with proper fire restrictions and other things. So, so I applaud that. And I'm glad that we're getting away. When this first came up in, I think it was 2013, the reality was that uh, some of the areas that were restricted were restricted purely on political grounds. The district councillor didn't want secondary suites in his or her district. And this is a much more objective and logical way to govern secondary suites. But perhaps you could address some of those questions. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Through you, Mr. Chair, I wouldn't mind starting. Um, and then Andrea can probably finish it off. Um, I just wanted to let the committee know and members of the public know that leading into this, we've had a couple meetings with the ministry and they made it pretty clear at the outset that the only standard that they would, now we've had subsequent conversations to this, but the only standard they wanted to start us with was one parking space required per unit. And that was the only thing they were really initially going to entertain and we've had subsequent discussions and been able to point to other municipalities as, as is in the report there to say that there are many real potential land use things that we need to wrap our heads around. And, and one of the big ones that Andrea spoke to was a three meter setback from the rear property line and the 1.2 meter setback from the side area. If you're now gonna allow someone to occupy an accessory building, you have habitation of a space in someone's backyard potentially. So what are the implications of that from a loss of privacy, obtrusive overlook and those sorts of things. So. The stacked tandem parking piece is one that we're, we've scenario tested. We think that it can work. Um, we think that it can allow for second units in contexts where there's just not simply enough room to, to add more asphalt, nor do we maybe want that. Um, the committee of adjustment versus planning committee approach, certainly depending on the nature of the relief sought and the number of uh, areas of relief sought, there are 20 or so provisions that we've walked through. So if people need relief from more than one or two provisions, it may not make sense to go through minor variance through the Committee of Adjustment. And uh, lastly, the duplex, I think the reality is, sure, you end up with something that is composed very much like a duplex in, in reality. Whether or not 40 versus 49 really has an, an impact on the ground, I think is up for discussion. But uh, this is another one that the Ministry has been pretty clear on and not being supportive of the 40% limitation. And I want to thank you for taking the restriction off of, but with conditions, off of the rural area. Uh, I previously have served on the Housing and Homelessness Committee, and there are a lot of people who have been born and raised in countryside, living in hamlets, not having an opportunity to find in their home community affordable housing. And, and so I applaud that aspect of it. Thank you. I'll look to, thank you. Uh, so we will now, unless there's further questions or comments, we'll turn to the public. Again, uh, both of these microphones are available. If you just move to a mic uh, and any, uh, just identify yourself with name and address and restrict your comments to five minutes. And I'll recognize this gentleman first. Thank you. I'm Gord Bennington, I live in Polson Park. Um, pretty good presentation, you guys are obviously um, quite familiar with a lot of technical details. So I'm hoping to get an answer that I've been struggling with for a while, and it concerns habitation versus a second dwelling in a cellar. So most of us understand that a cellar is 50% on average below grade, whereas 50% on average above grade would be a basement. So in a cellar, it appears that you could have, for example, maybe a guest bedroom or an office, your teenager could have his bedroom down there, that, I understand that would be habitation, whereas building a granny flat or an apartment in a cellar 
that would be uh, that would be different. But in some of the literature, um, secondary suites in a cellar are restricted. But is there talk of removing that restriction so that a secondary uh, dwelling can be in a cellar? If if I can just ask. Um and this is funny protocol, but if you address your questions through me, then, the, then our planning staff will write down all of the questions, and at the end of the public portion, they'll be happy to answer all of your questions. Okay. And if um, there are further questions or clarifications you need, you're welcome to contact in written form or, con or buttonhole them on the way out of the room later. It's just to avoid debates breaking out during this process. So, it thank you. It wasn't to be a debate. I thought, here's somebody that might know the answer to my yeah, technical question. and I'm question. sure he does, and he will definitely answer your questions. So, thank you. Uh, any further? Pardon? Ah, go ahead. My, my name is Carol Porter, and I've lived in Polson Park at 16 Bonnie Castle Court for 41 years. I'm very concerned about the number of houses in my neighborhood being bought by investors who do not live in these houses, but who rent out single rooms. Many of these houses were originally built as three-bedroom bungalows, but are now being advertised as six-bedroom houses. In addition to the three bedrooms on the main level, three more bedrooms are being built into the cellars. Most of these cellar bedrooms have small windows, and I believe the rooms are more than 50% below grade. Some of these rooms are targeting the student population of St. Lawrence College and some other transient populations. My concerns are as follows. Bylaws prohibiting cellar habitation were written for a reason, and I believe that that reason is safety. Proper egress in a fire is a major concern. Parking might be a problem. I have already seen cars in some of these houses creating their own double driveway by parking on the adjacent lawn area of the house. I have also seen cars parked on the front lawn. Parking on the street more than 12 hours is against the bylaw, but I routinely see cars parked there for many hours on the road. Parking on the street overnight in winter is also not allowed, but they do, and the city does not canvas the street to target ticket cars that do. On my narrow circular street, fire truck, ambulance, snowplow, and garbage and recycling access will possibly be impeded. Tenants living in these houses unsupervised by the owner can lead to many problems noise, litter, neglect of the house and yard, constant ten turnover, possible use of kettles, hot plates, and the like in small individual bedrooms, creating a fire hazard. These types of rentals, where many individual bedrooms are rented to individuals versus a family rental, will likely result in the devaluation of neighboring properties as people will balk at buying a house near them. These six-bedroom houses escape being called rooming houses because they put individuals under one lease. In my opinion, this is simply a way for an investor to escape having to be licensed as a rooming house, which would require more scrutiny by the city. In my opinion, these houses are in fact rooming houses despite the occupants being under one lease. Traffic in the area will increase we have many young families here and a local French immersion elementary school which attracts many families with children to our neighborhood. Increased intensification may overload municipal infrastructure such as sewers and drainage. A real concern for me is the response of authorities to monitor and respond to problems related to intensification. For example, noise, parking problems, property standards problems. I am concerned that the authorities will not address these situations in a timely and responsive manner. I am speaking from experience here. I have been told in the past by city parking personnel 
that even though parking on the street over 12 hours is against the bylaw, it is not enforced unless the vehicles are run down and left there for days. I have been told in the past that the city does not have enough personnel to enforce certain bylaws because they are stretched too thin. I feel that if the city loosens bylaws, will it be there to support residents, owners or renters in their attempts to lead mutually respectful and decent lives? Will the city be there to monitor and enforce property standard and parking bylaws? Our neighborhood is currently littered with cars parked illegal, illegally over 12 hours and overnight during the winter. No parking enforcement is being done except by repeated calls to the city. We require better municipal oversight if bylaws will be relaxed in the future. In conclusion, I feel that our neighborhood will be changed in a negative way if these multiple single bedroom rentals in basements are legal. 30 seconds. Thank you. Thank you. I'm finished. Oh, <laughs> we timed that well. Thank you very much. I believe there's one more gentleman on this side and a woman on this side. Thank you. Um, oh, thank and a gentleman. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Frank Dixon. So I'm going to start off by um, praising the report and thanks for the presentation tonight. That clarified a lot for me. Um, I think it's some of the highest quality work I've seen from city staff, so that's great. Um, just three questions. Um, so number one is, this was dealt with, I think maybe in part, but I'm still a bit, um, just kind of confused. Um, I guess it's sort of how to deal with the cases of sometimes what are called legal non-conforming, right? Where you may have renovations that have been done that you didn't know about or weren't filed in terms of a, um, an amendment or through committee of adjustment or um, some, some body, but they've actually been done and they're being rented out. So are you going to go around actually looking for those or are you going to wait for them to be reported or I'm just curious as to how you go about that? Obviously, you have uh, staff constraints. Um, second question was raised also by um, a citizen, and this has to do with some of my own experience, having lived in um, suites that are kind of like this, is the fire safety um, aspect. I think there's a lot of different uh, possible constructions that are, that are available out there, and I am concerned about units being advertised as secondary suites where fire safety provisions might not be adequate. Um, and then my uh, final point is, uh, speaking with the Hamlet areas, um, are those all basically located north of Highway 401 or maybe to the east and of Highway 15 and north of Highway 2, sort of in the rural area? Um, don't have a, a real good feel for where those actually are located. And I'll just conclude by saying that I'm in favor of the change uh, in the general sense, because um, as the chair was explaining, this is a way of expanding the supply of affordable housing, which is very much needed in Kingston. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, and I believe there's a microphone open right here. Thank you. That was on. Is it on? Sure. I'm Frank Huntley, 22 Redden Drive, Kingston. I have no idea what the postal code is, sorry. Uh, I've been waiting a couple of years at least for this to be passed, so I'm glad to see it's happening. It does seem a well-balanced and thought-through process. I remain a bit skeptical about coach houses because I, in my neighborhood, there's large backyards and everybody can see like a green space. It's like you have a built-in park. And if you just somebody sticks a coach house in the middle of it, it's going to destroy the value of the of the yard. So I'm a bit concerned about that, but if the province means you have to, I, I guess you have to. I also am, the 40% the in the basement, I kind of agree with because that forces, what well, unfortunately, but it makes it normal that you would have a, f a furnace room and a, and, a, and, a, and a repair room in the basement. Uh, so the house is a, a bit better taken care of and there's a way for everybody to get to the electrical boxes uh, safely. Anyways, those are comments, but my main question is, I couldn't tell at all what you were talking about with the areas where uh, 
it's going to be restricted because of capacity. Like I saw two red things, and I'm like, is, A, is that in my area? And B, what does it mean if it's restricted capacity? Does the city have any obligations or plans to deal with the capacity problems anytime in the near uh, future? Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, <laughs> my name is Anne Kazabowski. Um, so my reason for coming to the mic is basically to support um, the lady from Polson Park and, and other people who are interested in um, second units. But again, my biggest concern is how the city is going to monitor. I do have some investment properties and probably for most people here, they probably think I should be on the other side <laughs> of the track. But my biggest concern is I do believe that income properties and residential can mix together, but over the past years, I continue to improve, to improve my properties, but I have constantly called the city to uh, note parking on lawns, um, multiple cars in the driveway, parking on sidewalks, and yes, these are probably near some of the uh, colleges and that, but still, it, it's not right. We, we can't park on our lawns, and the garbage, and I do agree also that there are places where they're putting way too many people in the houses. Um, there's no windows for some of the areas. There are people who are flying out of the radar. And yes, there's probably not enough staff, but again, if they open the doors to allow more residential units, secondary units, et cetera, et cetera, it can work, but not unless it's properly set out and monitored. And it's a shame for the residential areas, for the people who, in my opinion, feel that a lot of these people who are buying for investors, myself included 12 years ago, I bought in a nice area. I want to have nice neighbors, respect, it's safe, it's clean. But over time, when people come in and they don't look after their properties, they don't respect the neighbors, they don't respect the laws, they park on lots, they don't clean up their garbage, then it downgrades the neighborhood. And it's tough because I've also, on different times, spoke on behalf of some of my elderly neighbors because they are afraid and are intimidated by tenants, mostly who are young people, who will not listen to them or respect them. And so they're intimidated by them that they might have some repercussions about somebody throwing something on their lawn or talking back to them. So I think it's really a big concern about how they go about implementing this and yet controlling it so that it doesn't devalue any of the areas um, that they allow this to happen. That's my big concern. Thank you. Uh, yes. Thank you. My name is Donald Mitchell and I live at 43 Gibson Avenue. Um, I just had a couple questions. So uh, one is my understanding is I'll get another opportunity to, to speak to this. There'll be another public opportunity. Uh, I'm confused about a number of things, but I guess I'll start with that there was this Zoning and Bylaw 8499 removal of conversion provisions last year. I think it's report D14 0172017. And it's like for parts 5.23 and 5.23A of the zoning bylaw. So I don't understand how that fits in with what this is. My layperson's take, and I don't have a planning background and I'm not an academic, but my layperson's take is that this is essentially saying that the province wants every home to be able to have a second unit and that this is the policy that's gonna do that. And then they use other language to leverage that. You know, so when I flip through the report, I, I look at the section that has the nice bullets that's about affordable housing and we're all for affordable housing and I'd love to see affordable housing but there's like five bullets, and only the last bullet of it actually addresses the real issue, which is to create um, developer you know, economy and get that stuff going and create renovations. And the rest of them are all about how mom and dad will be able to live in the secondary suite, and they're about how we're gonna create affordable housing and everything, but the report itself, to me, as a layperson, has no science, no data, no information about how it's gonna deliver affordable housing, there's no numbers, there's no saying, do we need affordable housing that's two bedroom units? So we talk about Guelph 
that has a restriction to two bedrooms? Is, is that why they have it? Because by restricting it to two bedrooms, you keep it away from going to five bedrooms or north of that, so that it's not as attractive to a whole bunch of individuals who all want to live together, but actually it's for single mom and a kid or who, you know, and, and I don't see seniors in this. I certainly don't see accessibility hugely figured in this. Uh, and so I'm just, I'm looking about how the affordable housing piece sort of weighs into this. I still just see this as a leverage that we all know what's going to happen if you treat one province, one city, as the same planning rules, the path of least resistance is going to see where the biggest draw is, is where we're going to maximize these units in order to get the most bedrooms possible. And so th that perplexed me, um, but I, I think I have other opportunities to talk about it, so I'll jump off that, but I would love to delve into the affordable housing piece a little more. I'd like to delve into the comprehensive report more because I think there's data and information that's missing for us that would make the rationale of why this is so good um, come across to me, but I don't get it. I think the parking recommendations should accompany a more robust on-street permit program. I think we should be going to something like Toronto, where everybody knows where they stand. And if, if I live in Toronto and someone in this room here comes to visit me, you know, we know how to arrange the permit, you know, online and stuff like that. And because we all know that there are going to be units that have 10 bedrooms and maybe eight cars are going to show up for a couple of critical periods during the year, if not longer. And how do we deal with that? And, and how do those impacts and adverse um, effects on other neighbors, how is that all dealt with? I don't see that. The final thing, and then I will be quiet, um, I just wondered about the water and basements because I live in an area and our house has been in the family, I think it's 60 years, 65 years, and we know there was no water in our basement until I think it was July of 2011. And I come home to uh, my wife in the basement with my son and nine inches of water everywhere because of a huge storm event that we had. Um, and it was really, really weird. But if we start making these suites in cellars and basements in areas that actually are known to have double sump pumps going, you know, and backup batteries for them and that have never traditionally had water, but it came in through the sewer in my basement. It came in through our shower for some reason. Why all of a sudden? You know, that's someone's home. Where do they go? when all their belongings get flooded out and everything. And so I'd like to go further into the basement water piece. And I think we need more data. I think you have it. I mean, we put in a backflow valve. People put in sump pumps and everything according to the municipal program. I think some of that data should be, should inform not just the staff. I get, I have to say, I, I fully support council and I fully support staff. And the more I study this stuff, the more I'm amazed by what you do, but I, I think there should be more than just the staff, tick box, technical circulation. It would be nice if we could actually have some of the data there to look at what areas are strategically better or worse. And I know I'm over time. I appreciate your time. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, yes. Sorry, I've never done this before. Uh, my name is Jesse Corcoran. I live at 662 Portsmouth Avenue. I don't know if this falls under the appropriate zoning, um, but uh, I had a question about plumbing, um, more particularly plumbing going into the sewers. And I don't know if it's, it's outlined in the uh, accessory building regulations, but um, are they required to go, to go directly into the city or are they going to be added onto the, the pipe of the principal dwelling and into the sewers? I know there's an incentive being put forward for $15,000 for to create secondary dwellings. Um, but my uncle, Dan Corcoran, told me that the if you're attaching it directly to the sewers, it's a $12,000 operation. And whereas if you're adding it to your own pipe going out, it's only a $2,200 situation. So I was wondering if the committee is going to be allowing some kind of compensation in that regard for uh, homeowners who are building uh, coach houses. Okay. Thank you. Uh, seeing no further hands, uh, I'll play auctioneer. Going, going, gone. Uh, so I will invite our staff to address some of those concerns that were expressed.
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so in regards, um, the first question was pertaining to um, whether this would allow for second units um, to actually be in the cellar and whether they were permitted there before or not. Um, and the answer is currently in the old um, city area, they were not permitted in the cellar. So any habitation unit or second unit or anything in, in that regard was not permitted in the cellar, which um, the gentleman was correct in saying, which is considered to be 50% um, below below grade. Um, changes to this would, would now open that up um, and, and allow that um, to, to occur. Um, but it's important to note as well that the Ontario Building Code um, also allows um, habitation units in the cellar um, it, in accordance with certain criteria under the code being met. Um, so that doesn't preclude someone from still having to comply with the building code um, and, and fire code associated with that as well. Um, the next one, just get my bearings here. Um, so, um, concerns raised uh, um, parking, um, front lawn parking, a number of those things. Um, in hearing a lot, maybe that can address some of the other comments as well. Um, primarily, I hear a lot about um, property standards um, type comments. Um, so, the, I mean, the ability to establish second units, the proper property standards, and the other bylaws do still stand, whether they're noise bylaws. Um, parking bylaws, so those those are all still relevant um, as, as a result of this. Um, I think that there was a question in, um, I just don't want to miss something. Um, sorry, I think it's like a question I just missed. Did you want to speak to that? Um, I'll just uh, turn over to Greg on the residential licensing piece that's being proposed, as he's a little bit more familiar with that. Sure, thanks, Andrea. So through you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, so a lot of comments tonight about the concerns around implications of parking, additional parking on the street, um, the ability for the city to enforce parking, parking on a front lawn, um, and, that, and uh, the safety of a unit meeting the Ontario Building Code, meeting fire code, and a whole list of other things where you store garbage and that sort of thing, the upkeep of a building. And so this is not new to second residential units. This is something the city is actively evaluating right now through the consideration of a rental licensing program, which would enable the city uh, to have better access into confirming compliance with the Ontario Building Code and Fire Code for units that maybe have slipped through the cracks. We do largely work on the basis of complaint. We're not actively out there patrolling the streets for people parking on front lawns. Unfortunately, we just don't have the capacity to do that, but in tandem with the discussion around a rental licensing program, there will be information presented to council in the not too distant future about the number of staff it's going to take to properly administer uh, the rental licensing program. And hand in hand with that, the monitoring of licensees and their adherence to certain property standard obligations. Um, We'll certainly make note of the comments about monitoring overflow parking on streets. Uh, that has been the recurring theme in some of the feedback that we've received to date. Uh, but that's just an update on, on the rental licensing piece. There is, it's an active project right now that the city had an information report, I think, I think it went to council last month. So people that want to uh, take a look at what that entails, uh, there is an, uh, an information report to council that went, I think, June the 12th. Um, and there's more, more to come. Um, so some of the additional questions um, in regards to um, legal non-conforming units, so these could be second units um, that are currently existing and, and they may be in an area where it's currently not permitted, but they were established um, quite some time ago before our bylaws were in place, and so they do have the uh, legal non-conforming status, um, and then there are some um, illegal units out there. Um, but in regards to the comments around illegal in units and how they're enforced, I mean, we, we are made aware of them um, regularly from complaint basis and, and a number of times coming through the fire department drawing our attention to them as well. Um, and we do act on them and the fire department gets involved to ensure they comply with code. Um, and if they're not permitted, then um, they, they are required to proceed through zoning amendments and, and so on. So we do actively enforce um, those on a regular basis. Um, in regards to hamlets and, and where they're located, um, there are some in the... Um, the main ones, I mean, Elgenburg, Glen Burnie, Sunnyside, Kingston Mills, uh, Joyceville, Brewers Mill, but majority of north of the 401. Um, I could provide you with a map that um, that maybe you could blow up and maybe help, help you um, see the exact locations a little bit, and I'm happy to get your email and, and send that to you. Um, 
if that'll as uh, assist that way. Um, Um, ca capacity um, coming up a bit um, in, in basement flooding, um, and then the comment as well in, in wanting to um, see the particular areas that may be subject to um, these servicing constraints. Um, thank you for that comment, and, and no note that point. Um, when we do come um, back for another public meeting, I think maybe I'll blow up individual areas that that can be seen clearly. It's hard to see on the map. Um, in the meantime, though, I'm, I'm happy to show those to, to people in the, in the meantime as well and what those particular areas are. Um, but we did um, work specifically with Utilities Kingston. Um, and so in areas that um, are known for sewer surcharging because there's areas of combined storm and sewer systems um, and, and so on, we, we have flagged those areas and do not permit the um, second units and basements in those particular areas. Um, there's a question in regards to infrastructure upgrades. Um, some of the sewer surcharging areas um, are around the, the west end, around the Days Road area. Um, and then there's, there's some infrastructure upgrades planned for around 2020 to the Days Road pumping station. So we anticipate the um, issues there to be alleviated at that time. Um, in the northern part of the East End urban boundary, um, there's sewage capacity issues that are um, expected to be relieved next year, according to Utilities Kingston. So I think we'll see um, those restrictions lifted there um, sooner than later. Um, the combined sewer areas um, are in an, a number of pockets in the downtown area. Um, those ones become a little bit more complicated um, because it is quite a process to um, separate um, the, the storm and the, and the sewer systems. Um, and in those particular areas, we have capacity issues um, and sewer surcharging issues. Um, but um, it is something that is on Utilities Kingston's radar. Um, so that's just a bit of an update on some of the infrastructure upgrades. Um, prohibited in the basement. Um, um, comments um, around um, uh, leases and what's a rooming house and what isn't a rooming house. Um, that, that is something um, I agree that can get um, complicated. Um, essentially, if there is a, um, a group of people that are that are one lease, um, it becomes difficult in accordance with human rights code and um, regulating um, what, a, what a family is and um, sort of people zoning that way. Um, so if it is a group of people together and they're on the same lease and whether they're friends or they're family or um, it becomes harder to regulate as um, rooming houses. So that is a, a difficult one, but I, I, do, un I do understand the, um, the point that's taken. Um, and again, second, Second units, though, it's important to note as well that we are only allowing one per, um, per, per, per house as well, so you couldn't have multiple um, units established in, in any of these homes. Um, in, in regards to statistics, um, in providing a number of statistics, um, there, I, I think you'll see that when we come forward with a more comprehensive report, this is our first um, go ahead at, at this as well, um, and when we come back and actually are making specific um, recommendations after we've reviewed all the impact, all the input, then I think at that point you'll see that there'll be a, a lot more detail and rationale and justification um, for each of these provisions that we're recommending. Um, I guess the other thing that it's in, important to note too, um, it, it isn't um, affordable housing is one of the um, largest things that comes up in regards to second units, um, but there's a, there's a number um, of other rationales for them too, such as increasing the supply of rental housing and particularly in Kingston currently having such a low vacancy rate. Um, all the rental housing that we can put into the market right now, um, um, we would see as a good thing. Um, it, it, provincial policy also speaks to providing a various amounts of different housing types and housing options for people. Um, so in, in that case too, there is various forms of housing. So there's a, a number of um, things that we see as po positive to this um, as well. Um, some of the comments in, comments in regards to wanting to see more with seniors, um, there's a lot of talk as well that it, um, also provides um, options for seniors to um, stay, have an age in place um, and being able to stay in their homes more because they're able to gather additional income um, from having a second unit. So that would be another comment that I would make in regards to that. Um, I don't know if I missed anything. Uh, just, just a couple things I'll add. So um, 
so as Andrea mentioned, the age in place is important for seniors. I know Mr. Mitchell uh, commented on that. Um, the way the province has framed it and the way we sort of summarize it in the report on page six is that it's not just to allow for, say, a senior to subsidize their daily expenses, but to also have a live-in caregiver live in a unit above or below where they, they occupy uh, a second unit, or perhaps they have extended family uh, living in the same structure. So that's part of the uh, thinking um, presented by the province in some of this. And the, um, the removal of conversion provisions, uh, as Mr. Mitchell mentioned, was done to avoid um, forms of intensification that we really didn't have much of an opportunity to review. Um, it was fairly carte blanche, and here what we're doing is we're introducing this opportunity for, as of right, introduction of second units, subject to 20-some-odd zone provisions that really tighten up the expectations. And the only other comment, um, I guess there's one to Ms. Corcoran's uh, point about uh, connecting into the main within the road allowance versus connecting in uh, to the connection that the existing house is served by. So the um, limitation here would be that you have to be serviced from the existing connection to the lot. So Utilities Kingston's uh, policy is one service per lot. So you can have this, say, a coach house connecting into the road with a different line. It would have to be off the existing line that serves the main, main dwelling. Um, so if we haven't spoken to your comment tonight, um, the next stage in this is to compile all the comments and to think through them, and then we'll eventually prepare the final draft of the zoning and a comprehensive report, as Andrea mentioned, and so we'll elaborate more on the feedback tonight in that, in that report. Great. Thank you, and thanks to everybody who had issues or questions. I just want to point out, um, I know that... Uh, residential rental licensing was referenced, but it wasn't discussed tonight. And the reason I'm pointing that out is uh, I've always declared a conflict. Every time it's come to council for discussion, debate, I'll do the same if it comes to a vote. Uh, my daughter owns a couple of rental properties. I own one rental, uh, one home that I happen to rent. So that puts me in a conflict situation. Uh, it doesn't put any member of the public, uh, doesn't have the same regulations. So, uh, so I appreciate uh, your understanding. I almost stood up and declared a conflict, but I think because it wasn't really discussed, it was just referenced. So um, any further comments or questions? Seeing none, um, again, could you take the chair? Thank you very much. A couple of things that came up tonight. Um, there, were some, there were some clear references to bylaw enforcement and frustrations that some residents have with bylaw enforcement. I just want to point out in 90, 95% of the bylaw enforcement is complaint driven. So if there's an issue on your block, you need to call uh, the, uh, the customer service line or contact your counselor. And bylaw is now under the same umbrella as planning, so uh, they can respond to that. Uh, so that's, that's your best bet. There, were also, there was also some reference uh, to frustrations with the kinds of tenants that are moving into, into your neighborhood. The Human Rights Code of both Ontario and nationally says that zoning has to be based solely on land use and cannot reference the type of tenants. And so uh, we're forced, as frustrating as that can be sometimes, we're forced to not address the fact that it might be students or it might be young people that are, are living at a certain residence. It has to be based solely on issues of land use planning. 
and um, so uh, you're welcome to come to a mic and talk about it, but there's not much that we as a city council can do about it. So, uh, so I'm done my preaching for tonight. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to thank uh, the committee. I think we're all done. Oh, oh, I just had one more really quick question. Um, am I right to assume that under the new PPS and the regulations that have applied, our only sole rationale for saying no to a secondary suite when this is passed will have to be based on servicing issues and that the whole city, unless otherwise identified, uh, will have by right secondary suites. Is that an accurate statement? Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, the, it's accurate in that it will be permitted as of right in all zones, um, aside from the servicing constraint areas, as you mentioned. Um, but as noted, there are a number of zone provisions that you still have to comply with. So if someone does not meet the setbacks, if someone cannot put a coach house in and they can't meet landscaped open space, they, they wouldn't be permitted to have one unless they went through a Planning Act process. And if it is restricted for a servicing rationale, is the expectation from the province that the municipality will uh, have a plan to address that, uh, that deficiency? They have, they have indicated that they're in support of those particular restrictions. They understand that they're primarily they get into risks of health and safety and, and other such matters that, that Trump providing a second unit. Um, so they, they have indicated to us that they're in support of that. Um, I think they'd like to see, they like that we had provisions in that once infrastructure upgrades are made, um, that we would initiate the process to lift those restrictions. Um, but I, I, I didn't get any indication that they would try to hold us to uh, forcing our hand in trying to upgrade upgrade things faster than we'd otherwise have planned. Thank you for that very detailed report. I appreciate it. So I'll declare this final public meeting closed. Uh, now we'll go to the regular planning committee meeting, uh, number 14-2018, which really has little or no business. Uh, so we'll call the meeting to order. Thank you, Councillor Turner, Councillor Sanic. Approval of the agenda that isn't really there. Councillor Asanic, Councillor Turner. Uh, confirmation of minutes from our June 21st meeting. Uh, Councillor Turner, Councillor Asanic. All those in favor? Carried. Uh, and disclosure of pecuniary interest? Seeing none. Uh, we have no delegations. We have no business. We have no briefings. Uh, Oh, planning advisory working group notes. Uh, they came to us by way of information. Are there any comments or questions on those? Seeing none, uh, we have no motions. We have no notices of motions. Uh, we have no other business. Uh, correspondence, uh, we received. Any comments on that? Seeing none. Date and time of our next meeting, August 2nd. 2018, uh, and that will be, unless uh, there's a call uh, from the chair, that will be our only other meeting over the summer. So, Mo motion to adjourn. Thank you. All those in favor? Carried. Thank you very much.